Thank you for joining me for Bible Studies for Life. We are on our six-week session of Living with Hope in a Broken World, and this week we're on session four. And where I am, it's Friday night, and I'm in a camper. And this is actually my second time recording because the first time was time-lapse. I don't think you want to watch that one. So, today's lesson is the endurance of our hope. The author asks a question, when have you ever needed endurance to complete a task? Well, today was one of those days for me. We went on a bike ride. It was hot. I was sweaty. It was muggy. And I didn't bring water. So I was ready to be done with the bike ride. And I needed some endurance to get to the final stopping point. Now that was a much lighter note. But the writer says in his book that no one signs up for pain, sorrow, disappointment, betrayal, or rejection. But they happen. And that's true. Loving Jesus does not insulate us from pain and suffering. Now, I have no personal example that comes to mind when I think of suffering greatly. However, many of my family members and friends do, and because they suffer, I suffer greatly with them. We've been there with lots of people through miscarriages and the loss of children and divorces and burying of husbands and physical illnesses emotional loss emotional instability and physical or financial ruin jesus sees he hears and he knows and he cares it's essential to our faith that we not let these catastrophic experiences define us now shifting gears here again, Peter's audience that we're going to be looking at and reading from 1 Peter chapter 3 today, remember they were facing persecution for their faith. In America here, we rarely suffer great persecution for our faith. I know some might disagree with me, but if you've ever taken the time to read about missionaries or to speak with them personally and also if you consider what Jesus and his followers went through with their persecution you may consider our persecution to be light in comparison so when the writer gave us his personal example of facing cancer and when I mentioned that I've suffered with my family and friends through their trials and times of just great, great suffering. It's a reminder that just as Peter was writing to his audience who was suffering greatly because of their faith in Jesus, we too are going to suffer trials, but it's how we handle them and how we persevere and how we push through and endure those trials that people will be watching and people will see. And the point is today that we can endure suffering because of our hope in Christ. And in 1 Peter, we're going to be in chapter 3, verse 8, and we're going to read through verse 12 to begin with. Now finally, all of you should be like-minded and sympathetic. You should should love believers and be compassionate and humble, not paying back evil for evil or insult for insult, but on the contrary, giving a blessing since you were called for this, so that you can inherit a blessing. For the one who wants to love life and to see good days must keep his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit, and he must turn away from evil and do what is good. He must seek peace and pursue it, because the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are open to their request. But the face of the Lord is against those who do what is evil. In verse 8, 
Peter uses a general approach. He says, all of you. In his appeal to his followers of how they should conduct themselves. Now in your book, if you have that, it lists six ways that we can walk the talk. And the first one that they make reference to is unity. We should be like-minded. We should think alike in our core values and our core doctrines. And the second thing is mutual concern. We should be sympathetic, have compassion, feel with those who suffer, enter into their personal pain. And the third thing is love. And that's the Greek word Philadelphias, which is love for fellow believers or a brotherly love. The fourth thing is compassion. And that's the Greek word. I really can't pronounce it. It starts with an E. And it means tender-hearted. Be sensitive to the needs and the opinions of others. And the fifth thing is humility. Consider others to be more important than yourself. And the sixth thing is forgiveness. And that comes out of verse 9. Not paying back evil for evil or insult for insult, but giving a blessing. And then in verse 10 through 12, Peter goes on to quote Psalm chapter 34, verses 12 through 16. The psalmist that he's referring to here had based his encouragement on trusting God for a long and happy life. We are eternal beings. Our lives now will impact our lives in eternity. And the psalmist urges believers to guard against speaking evil. If you want to read about guarding against speaking evil, go to James chapter 3, specifically verses 1 through 12. And that can be a reminder of taming your tongue and how that blessing and cursing can come out of the same tongue. And how that speaking kindness and speaking ugliness can come out of the same tongue. And how it should not be so, but it happens every day. And the second thing he says is to reject evil. And the one way we can reject evil is we replace it with something good. When we have an evil thought or an evil desire against someone or against a way of thinking, replace it with something good. And the third way is to seek peace and pursue it. Be intentional about avoiding contentious behavior. If you know there's contentious behavior, go around about a different way to avoid it. Peter's readers were experiencing trials. And remember, these were trials because they were following Jesus. And he quoted the psalmist out of Psalm chapter 34 to encourage them to remain faithful and obedient. And just like he used the psalms to encourage his believers, or his followers, and his friends, we should do the same. If we know a believer is suffering or in pain, we should use the scripture to encourage them. Now let's look at the second part of those verses in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 13 and 14. And who will harm you if you are deeply committed to do what is good? But even if you should suffer for righteousness, you are blessed. Do not fear what they fear or be disturbed. Now in verse 13, that can be really confusing because Peter is not saying, if you do good, no harm will ever come to you. Paul experienced pain and suffering because of being a believer in Jesus. And you can read about that in a lot of passages, but if you go back to 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 23 to 27, you can see right there a whole accumulation of them in one area of verses. Paul was flogged, he was in prison, he was stoned, he was shipwrecked, he was hunger, like really hungry, you know, starvation. He experienced lots of physical pain. And Jesus taught us in John chapter 15, verse 18 through 20, that as a believer, we will face persecution. And I'm actually going to read you those verses, John 15, 18 to 20. Jesus said, 
If the world hates you, understand that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love you as its own. However, because you are not of the world, but I have chosen you out of it, the world hates you. Remember the word I spoke to you. A slave is no, is no greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they kept my word, they will also keep yours. So what did Peter mean in verse 13 when he said, And who will harm you if you are deeply committed to do what is good? What did he mean by that? The author suggested that he meant that our good conduct may convince those that we don't know to respect us and not persecute us. Maybe so. Either way, we know that Jesus and the New Testament writers said that Jesus' followers will face verbal attacks and physical and emotional persecution. That is very probable. In verse 14, he tells them to rejoice in their suffering. Paul and James said that we should rejoice when we face suffering and trials for our faith. We're not rejoicing in the suffering itself, but in the good that will come out of the suffering. God will work through our suffering, and we will grow and mature and be strengthened and be better because of his faithfulness. Next, Peter encourages them to be respectful when they are explaining the hope that they have in Jesus. And that's in 1 Peter 3, verse 15 to 17. I'm going to read those. But honor the Messiah as the Lord in your heart. Always be ready to give a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. However, do this with gentleness and respect, keeping your conscience clear, so that when you are accused, those who denounce your Christian life will be put to shame. For it is better to suffer for doing good, if that should be God's will, than for doing evil. In your books, the writer says that when we are tempted to fear, we are to respond correctly. And he gives us some ways to do that. The first one is holiness. Holiness means different, set apart, not like the others. If we're set apart, we are not intimidated, but rather a bold witness for our future hope. If we know our hope is in Jesus, we're not intimidated to say it and to share it. So we should remain holy. We should remain set apart from the world, not like the world. The second one is holiness has to be first. That has to be our top priority. Living a different life, a set apart life, has to be our top priority. We can't blend in with the world. And that's not to say our physical appearance, remember. That's in the way we choose to live. People are going to say, why would you do that? Why would you give yourself to this situation? You're just going to get hurt. Why would you not invest in retirement and instead invest in other people's lives? Why would you do this and not do this? Because when we blend in with society, we become like society and we aren't going to face persecution. Most of our persecution is going to come within our own friends and family members and within our own church because we don't stand out and stand, we stand with our um, believers. We, we kind of blend in with society. We don't stand out in that world and they question what we do and why we would do it. A lot of times we question why missionaries would go into a foreign country and surrender their lives and sell their houses. We wonder why they would do that. Well, that's what God called them to. And instead of questioning their surrender, we should be thankful for that and pray for them and help them through that. So holiness has to be first. We can't blend in. And readiness is the third thing. 
When asked about what we believe, we can stand firm and offer a response to our hope in Jesus rather than falling into fear. If we're ready to give our answer, we're ready. We have it. We're responsible. Always be prepared to explain what you believe about the meaning and the purpose of life. Never hesitate. Your purpose in life is to honor God and serve other people. And always be ready to be that defensive in your response. How should we share our hope? The first way is through gentleness. The Greek word translated gentleness here means strength under control. And that comes through Jesus. And the second thing is to respect respectful attitude towards other people. The third thing is a clear conscience, knowing you are innocent of wrongdoing, even if you're attacked of the wrongdoing. In verse 17, Peter talks about this persecution being God's will. This means it's under God's control. He permits it at times, and he'll give us the strength to endure it. This suffering Peter's referring to, remember, is strictly persecution for being a believer in Jesus. Maybe you've never suffered persecution for your faith, but your faith has been tested by what you've been through, by your suffering or your trials. And as the writer described in the beginning of the lesson of his trial or facing cancer, or the things I've mentioned that we faced with our friends and our family members of their suffering, how will you endure suffering because of your hope? How do you endure suffering because of your hope? One way we can endure suffering through our hope is surrender to Christ completely. And I know it sounds cliche in the Christian world, and it's kind of a, a Christian way to say things, to give it to God. But what we mean by that is to accept it, and to trust that his plan is greater than ours. It doesn't mean we don't get angry. We do get angry. It doesn't mean we don't cry out and ask why. Jesus did that in the garden. We do ask why. We do hurt. It's okay to be angry. It's okay to be upset when you suffer. But not to let that control you. You fight through it and you know that in the end that the hope you have in Christ and the endurance that you have coming that you're going to face ahead will be worth it and every day it's picking your feet up and putting one foot in front of the other like I told you in the beginning I've not been there I hope I don't have to be but if I am I hope that just like we've suffered with others that I'll just have a community of friends and family there to suffer with us and that you all will pray us through those things just as we try to do that for you all. The second way that we can show our hope in Christ is to bless other people. We can be loving to them, compassionate towards them and their opinions, and we can be humble. Remember, humility means putting them before us anyway. And the third thing is to defend our hope. Don't let these catastrophic experiences, and they are catastrophic, don't let them control your future and control the rest of your life. Don't let these hurtful experiences define who you are. If you're a believer, you're a believer and you have the hope of eternity and remember everything that you go through here in your earthly life will impact you in eternity so allow jesus to minister to your hearts if you are suffering and if you know someone who is facing persecution for their faith figure out a way you can reach out to them and minister to them especially do it through prayer but maybe they're not suffering for persecution for their faith. They're just suffering trials in general. Pray for them, minister to them, be there for them, and suffer with them. We can endure. We can push through. We can
focus on the end because we know that our hope is in him and it's in the resurrection that is to come it's already taken place in his body and because it's already been taken place in his body that we will be able to be resurrected with him again too thank you for listening to the endurance of our hope I hope that you will be able to join us for the live YouTube of Second Baptist Way Cross and also be able to listen to the other lessons that are offered um, throughout the week. And if you don't have time to watch them, you can listen to them on podcasts, Spotify. Um, I'm not quite sure of all the other ways you can listen to them, but you can go to our website, secondbaptistwaycross.com, and click on them and just listen to them in your car while you're driving. So once again, thanks for joining us, and next week we'll be on session five.